Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel, Captain World. Douglas McGregor dismisses the idea that there is any truth in the statements made by a particular individual. He suggests that the person is attempting to do whatever they can to involve the United States back into the war due to a sense of abandon. And McGregor highlights that financial support has dwindled, armed shipments have ceased, and the individual in question is desperate and at the end of their resources. Douglas McGregor expresses skepticism about the individual's motivations and suggests that given the dire situation they are in, they might say anything to salvage their position. He emphasizes the likelihood of the individual facing an unfavorable fate, considering the discontent among Ukrainians. McGregor also alludes to potential escape plans the individual may have. He asserts that the war is effectively over, pointing to the shift in focus from Ukraine to Georgia in the budget fight where the same proponents of war have redirected their attention to a different conflict. McGregor remains pessimistic about the outcomes in both scenarios. Douglas McGregor suggests that the individual in question might be receiving private advice, that the situation is untenable, and that stepping down gracefully would be a prudent course of action. However, McGregor doubts the individual's ability to do so. He envisions a scenario where someone else steps forward, representing the remaining Ukrainian state to engage in negotiations with the Russians. McGregor dismisses the idea of Ukraine becoming a contemporary equivalent of Napoleon's Spanish ulcer for Russia, emphasizing the likelihood of anyone in Europe desiring such an outcome. He concludes by acknowledging the ongoing fighting in certain areas. Douglas McGregor states that Ukrainians are barely holding on at the edge of a metaphorical cliff while the Russians continue to advance. He likens the situation to a deep retreat on steroids, suggesting that this phase of the conflict is nearing its conclusion. McGregor speculates about the remaining Ukrainian forces considering a retreat to the upper river and crossing it to evade further conflict. However, he emphasizes that the Russians will determine the next course of action and questions, whether they will offer any to. McGregor expresses skepticism about the possibility of effective communication with Russia, particularly from Western nations. He suggests that meaningful dialogue might only occur with new leadership in European governments. Drawing a historical parallel, he compares the situation to end of World War II when the Allies crossed Iran and the Soviets approached Berlin. Douglas MacGregor expressed his concern about the state of rights and freedoms in Ukraine under its current leadership. He highlights that the Ukrainian president has declared there will be no elections for the foreseeable future and has reportedly restricted the operations of the Orthodox Christian Church. Gregoire raises questions about the status of various rights outlined in the Bill of Rights and mentions the Ukrainian secret police, which he likens to the NKVD under Stalin, engaging in actions such as rounding up people and forcing them into uniform or disappearing them. Besides a specific case of an individual named Gonzago Lyra, an American citizen who is in a Ukrainian jail and suggests that the State Department appears disinterested in his case. Wayne McGregor describes this situation as a warning for everyone, emphasizing concerns about the administration's response to citizens in trouble. Douglas McGregor discusses the ongoing military situation in Ukraine. He notes that the Russian forces have been launching attacks at targets with military or political military value, and these attacks have been increasing in frequency. McGregor suggests that the Ukrainian forces are defecting in large numbers, citing issues within the Ukrainian military structure for medical treatment and evacuation. He anticipates that Russian forces will close in on Kiev and roll. McGregor expresses the view that the West has not taken effective steps to sober up and engage in diplomatic talks to discuss terms, providing no incentive for Russian forces on the ground to stop. Douglas McGregor discusses the initial Russian intervention in Ukraine. He notes that initially, there were criticisms about the perceived inadequacy of the Russian force with concerns about troop numbers and capabilities. McGregor acknowledges that Putin did not initially plan for a full-scale invasion, but expressed surprise at the level of hostility and hatred from Western capitals. He suggests that the Russian forces now have the capability to advance further into Ukrainian territory if they choose, considering the changed circumstances and the response from the West. Douglas McGregor provides into Russia's intentions in Ukraine, emphasizing that Russia doesn't seek to rule the Ukrainians or impose control over them. He points out that the Ukrainians have a strong sense of identity, cultural foundation, and language distinct from the Russians. 
Contrary to the notion of wanting to restore the Warsaw Pact, McGregor suggests that Russia doesn't desire the burden of governing Ukraine or investing resources in such endeavors. He highlights that Russia's actions will depend on who steps forward to that the war is over, a scenario yet to unfold in the West. McGregor anticipates that Russia might press toward the upper river as a natural dividing line between the two regions. Doug Douglas McGregor speculates on the future negotiations and developments in Ukraine. He suggests that the next step is to determine who will negotiate the terms. If no one steps forward, there is a possibility of Russia crossing the river and entering Kiev to shape the government according to its preferences. McGregor emphasizes that Russia will not accept a Ukraine hostile to its interests and off the table for NATO membership. Instead, Russia desires a neutral and friendly Ukraine that won't be part of a hostile alliance. He notes that the situation is contingent on unfolding events in Europe and Washington and highlights that nothing significant will happen until those dynamics evolve. Douglas McGregor expresses a critical view of Washington, D.C., describing it as paralyzed due to a mix of arrogance, ignorance, and stupidity. He asserts that the government has failed consistently in crucial areas of foreign and defense policy, leading to a defense establishment in ruins. McGregor points out the challenges faced by the military, including recruitment difficulties and a lack of resources to ammunition. He highlights the issues of open borders, economic strain from immigration, and a failing economy. Contrary to mainstream media portrayals, McGregor suggests that the financial situation is deteriorating. Douglas McGregor criticizes the U.S. government's handling of the Israeli situation, suggesting that instead of addressing the Israeli government and setting realistic limits, they have chosen the worst possible approach. He contends that the government should have conveyed its inability to support a major regional war due to various constraints. Drawing a historical parallel, McGregor refers to Secretary of the Treasury Mellon in 1929, who proclaimed unbroken prosperity just before making personal financial moves, indicating the opposite. McGregor asserts that the Washington establishment is built on lies and emphasizes the need for honesty in dealing with international affairs. Douglas McGregor expresses skepticism about the credibility of government audits and points out the lack of interest in conducting thorough audits in Washington. He cites an example of where someone planning to go to war might close their bank account as an excuse, implying that such financial maneuver might be a sign of impending conflict. McGregor criticizes the overall structural fragility of the U.S. Congress government, suggesting that the perception of American power from the outside is outdated. He emphasizes the significant changes that have occurred in the past 30 years, including demographic shifts and widespread discontent within the country. Douglas McGregor emphasizes the lack of societal cohesion in the United States compared to earlier periods, particularly during Gulf War I, argues that the U.S. is not in a position to engage in any war due to pressing domestic issues. Mark Rieger notes the significant expenditure on servicing the country's sovereign debt and highlights that normal circumstances, creditors would approach a debtor with restructuring suggestions to manage the situation. He draws parallels with Franklin Roosevelt's approach in 1932 and 1934, restructuring the debt without officially declaring a default. Douglas McGregor underscores the concept of restructuring the debt, questioning its feasibility in the current scenario. He delves into the holders of the debt, citing the Saudi, Chinese, Japanese, British, and other Europeans as major stakeholders. McGregor expresses doubt about the likelihood of these debts being repaid, as there's no apparent commitment to cutting spending. He paints a dire picture, suggesting that the nation is on the brink of a fiscal precipice, with some arguing that it may have already plunged over. The anticipation is that significant changes will occur when hitting rock bottom. But until then, the status quo persists due to past leniency. General Flint's assertions, according to McGregor, merely scratch the surface of the overarching issue. Douglas McGregor emphasizes that a significant portion of Americans remains indifferent to the unfolding challenges. Many believe that the government will resolve, 